in June 2011, Christchurch, New Zealand, suffered an earthquake that left a lot of the city in chaos, destroying buildings and infrastructure and leaving over 50,000 homes without power. As a result, there were collapsed houses, ruptured water mains, flooding and fires due to disrupted electrical lines. Due to the strong ground motions and intense shaking, part of the city experienced a strange phenomenon known as soil liquefaction. Sand boils emerged from asphalt roads, toppling and sinking cars, and causing boulders to fall from hills, resulting in more home damage. Soil liquefaction occurs when saturated soil loses its strength and stiffness in response to an applied stress, such as shaking or other sudden changes, such as a strong explosion. Loose, saturated soil or sand has a tendency to compress when a load is applied, but in the event of a stress, such as shaking or an explosion, we see the opposite. The soil tends to dilute and the result is treacherous quicksand or quick clay. The land turns to liquid, causing structures of heavy mass such as buildings, infrastructure and cars to start sinking, topple over or collapse. It can also affect dams and bridges. Turbidity currents can also form huge landslides that are impossible to stop. In the worst case scenario, entire cities may be destroyed. As you can see, liquefaction can move entire areas of land. The mud can rise dramatically and rapidly and its destructive force is unstoppable. It is a well-documented phenomenon. The 1964 earthquake in Nagata, Japan caused liquefaction and we can see the effects very clearly in these photos. The same here with the 1964 Alaska earthquake. Buildings toppling, cars sinking, infrastructure collapsing. Once the stress has subsided, the soil begins to solidify once again and we can see the aftermath. Uneven muddy streets remain where there was once road paving. Returning to photographs of 19th century cities, we see a similar situation here. The roads are unrefined and full of mud. We see unsophisticated, uneven, coarse and muddy roads everywhere against a backdrop of refined, sophisticated and magnificent architecture. Could these cities have suffered the similar fate of soil liquefaction that we see in more recent times? Perhaps. But unfortunately, muddy roads is not enough evidence to base any conclusions on, is it? Children are the most vital of questions. And adults, in their foggy stupor, usually provide the most unsatisfactory answers. Often regurgitating learned nonsensical information that leave the child's imagination unfulfilled. Squelching along these muddy 19th century roads, observing their surroundings, a child may ask, why did they build the windows so low to the ground? And what an excellent question. Yes, why indeed did they build windows on ground level? For you see, the people we see in these photographs, sadly, did not build this architecture. 
and maybe some of them at some point in their busy day-to-day -day life ask the exact same question. We see it everywhere. Windows at ground level. Windows partially below ground level. First floor entrances raised from the ground level. Steps leading down to entrances below ground level. We can find this in almost every major city across our realm. In both old photographs and when we walk in the streets today. And what does it tell us? That a society with access to modest construction tools and horse and car constructed their infrastructure by first spending countless amounts of hours and energy clearing land with a depth of over three meters to begin their construction? Building basement floors is incredibly hard work. Since the 20th century, large powered excavation machines such as backhoes and front end loaders have reduced the time and manpower needed to dig a basement dramatically as compared to digging by hand with a spade. Perhaps you could say that our historical ancestors were just that dedicated to the architecture they built. And you could say that many of the sunken buildings we see are actually due to elevations and depressions in the natural landscape. The official narrative, which is always full of inconsistencies, perhaps would suffice if it was not for contemporary excavation. When we look at photographs such as this, it immediately dawns upon us that what we are seeing are windows and doors two to three meters below the ground surface. Why are there windows and doors underground? What is this that we see in our cities? Natural soil accumulation over time? Geologists have never been able to ascribe a consistent value to worldwide natural topsoil accumulation because it is impossible. Some regions of our realm experience consistent topsoil accumulation, whereas other regions actually experience consistent erosion. Many historians and archaeologists have noted that many cities over the centuries have been destroyed through war, and natural phenomena such as earthquakes volcanic ash and flooding. Aren't these just the layers of previous civilizations? No, they are not. We see over and over again whole floors of buildings consistent with the architecture existing above the layer of ground.
You see, what lies beneath is not the unfamiliar traces of previous generations, but of the same generation that built these structures. And once you really see this kind of sunken, buried infrastructure that exists in such prevalence across our world, you can never unsee it. We see that the foundations of old churches are actually the original first floors with consistent entrances and windows. We see mosaics unearthed. We see pillars, columns and arches that were originally much larger. And it was the layer of soil that reduced their size. As if they weren't big enough to begin with. And like with the 1964 earthquake in Nagata, Japan, we also find many so-called ancient structures that are leaning. As if at some point, the soil beneath these structures loosened and liquefied. We have the Saharzan Church Tower and our dear lady at the Mountain Church Tower in Germany the Tiger Hill Pagoda in China, the Lenin Tower of Neveyansk in Russia, the Lenin Temple of Huma in India, Udkirk in the Netherlands, the Tower of Zaragoza in Spain, and, of course, the Tower of Pisa. The official liars of the world try to justify the buried and tilting structures we see, filling our heads with stories of antiquity and ever-changing geology but it becomes trickier for them when we turn our attention to America. If we are to believe their narrative, then all of the buildings we see in 19th century photographs of the burgeoning American cities are newly constructed. Why do we see famous structures, such as the Washington Capitol building, with consistent infrastructure that buries very deep into the ground. And again, the inconsistencies do not add up. Why would an underdeveloped people waste resources, energy and time constructing the foundations of the Capitol building to be consistent with the column style we find above the surface? The foundations did not have to feature columns. Columns, we are told, are a stylistic choice, not a functional one. So why would they do this? In a nutshell, they wouldn't. We see images that suggest that the people of the 19th century were actually concerned with moving a lot of the vast amount of mud we see, leveling the ground and excavating existing structures. 
The consistency and prevalence of buried architecture across our realm indicate that whatever happened was a worldwide event. Despite regional differences in natural topsoil accumulation and erosion. And there is no official narrative explanation that justifies the buried architecture we see. No explanation provided to justify the amount of mud we see in 19th century photographs of our cities. On the roads, mud piles from clearing, the roads uneven, the land ravaged, but the architecture grand, perfect and intact. Applauded by literary scholars for his use of fog as an opening simile and metaphor to paint a portrait of London as a corrupted hub amidst burgeoning industrialization. Many often overlook that Charles Dickens's 1852 novel Bleak House actually opens with a different image. London, Michaelmas term lately over, and the Lord Chancellor sitting in Lincoln's Inn Hall. Implacable November weather, as much mud in the streets as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. Liquefaction caused havoc across Christchurch and the Garter. But these were isolated earthquake events and only portions of each city were affected. It is not possible for there to have been huge simultaneous earthquakes around the world during a similar period. Or is it? Even Wikipedia tells us that liquefaction can occur naturally or artificially from an earthquake or other sudden change in stress condition. Even if this was the case, we do not see the same structural damage to the buildings in the 19th century like we do in cases such as Christchurch and Nagata. Most of the buried architecture we see is intact. It is either sunken or the ground level has been raised at least three meters, sometimes in a uniform manner and other times partially buried in rolling mud hills as if there were huge landslides. The strange case of the buried architecture provides the following conclusions. That what lies beneath are not the remains of previous civilizations. More often than not, the buried structures are consistent with the architecture we see above ground. That the structures are much larger than originally suspected and therefore they are even more of a construction impossibility for a Victorian generation of horse and car and those existing before them. That natural topsoil accumulation and soil liquefaction are not satisfactory explanations for what we see here. Whatever took place had to be something much larger and widespread such as a natural or artificial earthly cataclysm of sorts. As many of the photographs show, many citizens of the 1800s were responsible for moving much of the mud, leveling the ground and excavating buildings, which suggests that whatever happened had happened very recently in their past. The complete absence of a reasonable mainstream justification for the buried architecture we see suggests that the controllers of our realm are deliberately trying to hide whatever happened. And what of the deserted cities we see in the earlier photographs? If these cities were truly empty, then we must ask why. We must also ask how all the people got there in the end. In the space of 30 or so years, 
we see a city go from barren to bustling. Interestingly, it is Charles Dickens and 19th century literature more generally that offers some clues. Two central themes run throughout 19th century Victorian literature. That of marriage and female chastity and that of orphans and adoption. Many of the fictional characters we've come to love over the years are orphans. We have Oliver Twist and Pip from Great Expectations. We have little orphan Jane Eyre and Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights. We have Mowgli from The Jungle Book, Cosette from Les Miserables. We have Heidi, Rapunzel, Peter Pan, Snow White. We have Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and Anne of Green Gables. And these books were of their time as far as orphan prevalence goes. The only issue is that these novels romanticize the orphan as a figure dislocated from society by default and therefore pave their life's path as one of unforeseen opportunity. This was not reality. The theme of marriage and chastity that we find in so many 19th century literary works, such as those by Jane Austen, the Brontes, George Eliot, Dickens, Thomas Hardy, Leo Tolstoy, Victor Hugo and more, was nothing more than carefully disguised, well-written propaganda, with the sole purpose to solidify and justify a social value framework that would separate children from their mothers. Children born outside of marriage or wedlock were regarded as illegitimate, meaning they did not have a legal status. Illegitimate children was a serious stigma throughout the 19th century. The majority of employers would not hire women with an illegitimate child. Many unwed mothers with illegitimate children ended up without a home, in poor health, starving, exhausted. Their only place of refuge would be the workhouse, where they would carry out the most unpleasant duties. In some places, Women with illegitimate children were singled out and had to wear a special uniform which alerted everyone to their status as an unmarried mother or fallen woman. As a result, a vast amount of orphanages and foundling institutions were established. This is the London Foundling Hospital that was very active in the 19th century. Look at the size of it. Charles Dickens was obsessed with this place. Inspiration, they say. The official narrative tells us that an estimated 4,500 women handed over their children to this huge building. But this was just one institution. Wikipedia gives us a partial list of over 64 orphanages that were founded in the UK during the 19th century. The list is only partial. The peculiar case of the vast amount of parentless children in the 19th century is well documented by many researchers. And most of them agree, it is almost impossible to establish figures that really do justice to just how many orphans there were during this period. Their footprint did not enter the record books. It formed in the mud and was then washed away. It wasn't just the UK. This was a worldwide phenomenon. New York City had four foundling asylums alone that process thousands of children annually. 
By the beginning of the 20th century, Italy was reporting 32,000 children per year. Spain and Portugal were reporting 15,000 annual foundlings. Before 1860, 374,000 recorded infants were processed by the asylums in Milan, Naples and Florence alone. Historian David L. Ransell states that Moscow was receiving between 16 and 18,000 infants annually by the 1880s and sending over 10,000 of these each year to outlying villages for care. In 1882, there were all told 41,720 foundlings from the Moscow home living with 32,000 foster families scattered throughout 4,418 villages. A dozen villages had over 90 fosterings each. One thing that is often overlooked is that there were a series of laws passed in the 1800s, making it almost impossible for unwed mothers to keep their babies. The 1833 Poor Law Reformation introduced bastardy clauses that shifted the entire responsibility for the illegitimate child onto the mother. Social stigma meant that she would not be able to provide care for her child and would be forced to hand them over to the authorities, or worse. Advertisements for adoption or nurse care became popular in newspapers. And, as many scholars have pointed out, these were a front for what was termed baby farmers, or paid murder. As Dorothy L. Hallas states, the adverts may have been misleading to the general public, but read like a coded message to unwed mothers. No references are asked for, and none are offered. The sum of 15 shillings a week to keep an infant or a sickly child was inadequate, and a sickly child and an infant under two months were the least likely to survive and the cheapest to bury. Infants were taken, no questions asked, and it was understood that for £12 no questions were expected to be asked. The transaction between the mother and the baby farmer usually took place in a public place, on public transportation, or through a second party. No personal information was exchanged, the money was paid, and the transaction was complete. The mother knew she would never see her infant alive again. Most children, however, were not murdered, but were dropped off at the doorsteps of orphanages or the workhouse. All children taken into these institutions were given entirely new identities. They were provided for with shelter, food and clothing temporarily and then sent off to workhouses or another location. Photographs in the 19th century were scarce, but towards the end of the century, we see more photographs, and the last continent to experience such mass exodus of orphans was the United States. And it is here that we see evidence of the orphan train. The first group of these orphans arrived in Michigan in 1854 and from that moment on, the movement shipped hundreds of thousands of children across the states until it ended in 1929. Officially, there were over 97 institutions involved in orphans and orphan trains in the 19th century. And again, this was not just the United States. Annie McPherson will go down in history as a woman who scammed more than a hundred thousand foundlings 
and ship them from the United Kingdom to Canada, New Zealand and South Africa and even to the outer edges of the earth in Australia so that they could be sold into child labour. Why do we see so many photographs of orphans in workhouses? Why are they working with machinery created for adult use? Were there not enough adults during this time to carry out this work? And then there is the strange case of the burgeoning American amusement parks at the turn of the 20th century. In addition to rides and exhibits, many of these parks featured an unusual attraction. Infantoriums. Visitors of these parks could stroll around with ice cream and swing by these stations. A visit equivalent to that of a fully functional neonatal intensive care unit, complete with incubators filled with sleeping, premature babies. History has been kind to Martin Cooney. Touted as a hero, Cooney was the German mind behind the incubators. His first encounter with premature babies, we are told, was at the 1896 World's Fair. He knew immediately that the exhibition would save babies' lives. The technology to keep premature babies alive was expensive, and he knew the public would pay to see the babies in incubators. He would charge an entrance fee at the amusement parks to generate funds to help these babies live. Nurses tended to the babies as an enraptured public looked on. Like any other amusement, the premature baby exhibits included carnival barkers who tried to lure the public to come and see the babies. I don't know about you, but I find something very off about these incubators. Advertised as featuring living babies, a lot of the fairs where Cooney showed his babies also featured eugenics exhibitions. Eugenics is a field of corrupted pseudoscience that endorses selective breeding to improve the genetic quality of the human population. Eugenics was inspired by Darwinism and was a driving ideology that fueled the Nazis. Why are people paying to see living babies as if they had never seen a living infant before? Did people of the time not have their own babies? And where are these infants' parents? How did they have the technology in the 19th century to keep premature babies alive in such a way? Or is something off once again? with the official narrative. There were 80,000 premature babies who were treated in these amusement park incubators. 80,000. The hundreds of thousands of orphans in the 19th century are just barely believable. Were women really that carefree? Did America even have the population numbers to justify 80,000 premature babies. We are not talking orphans here, but infants born prematurely. The narrative is not convincing or realistically fathomable. Where did these babies come from? More troubling is Cooney's background. As many historians have pointed out, he had no medical degree or training. His story is a very similar one of unconvincing philanthropy that we find surrounding some of our contemporary figures today that also do not have medical degrees. And then there is Marie Dressler, a Canadian silent film and depression era movie star. She adopted one of these incubator babies. Ah, 
celebrities and adoption. The official narrative conveniently leaves this out of her story and tells us that she may have had a daughter who died as a small child. But the photographs suggest otherwise. Did she adopt her incubator baby at one of these fairs? Were the fairs a front for illicit adoption of premature babies? Even if they were premature, did that mean they had no parents? Who owned and was responsible for these parks? And what happened to the babies once they grew and left the incubators? If something feels eerily wrong about the entire narrative surrounding these parks and orphans, it's because we are not being told the truth. Why were there hundreds of thousands of parentless children in the 19th century? Where did they come from? They were relocated all over the world. Europe, America, Russia, Australia, Canada. Why? Especially when most still had a living parent. If pregnancy out of wedlock was such a social stigma that resulted in such trauma, why would so many people put themselves in that position in the first place? Did the government really care about social morality enough to pass laws? And all the effort to build and maintain orphanages and orphan relocation networks, would this not burden governmental finances and administration systems? It certainly would have. But, you see, there was a greater purpose behind the government's worldwide agenda. Repopulation. The social narrative of chastity was nothing more than propaganda and justification for stealing children. The reason we see empty cities in the early 19th century is because they were in fact empty, void of population. And the reason they are bustling 30 years later is because orphans were shipped into these cities to repopulate them. You see, in the early 19th century, there was a worldwide reset of sorts through depopulation and then repopulation. The people we see in these photographs did not build this architecture. They inherited it, along with a lot of mud. Not only did they inherit it without a clue as to what it actually was, and who it belonged to, but they were unknowingly complicit in repurposing pretty much all of these structures. I know, none of this is making much sense at the minute. You are probably wondering why on earth these cities were empty and full of mud. What happened that meant governments needed to repopulate the earth? And I know what you're thinking. This is all very intriguing, but what does this have to do with flat earth? You want to know more about the firmament, the sun and moon, and our stationary plane. Do not worry, everything will become clearer as we continue our journey. The prevalent evidence of buried infrastructure, coupled with deserted cities and a burgeoning industry of orphans is just the start. These are all necessary clues, hinting at some kind of cataclysm, but the real story hasn't truly begun yet. The stage had to be set first, and now it is ready. And even if you cannot see it yet, I know you feel it, viewer. The deserted cities, the buried architecture, and orphans all signal a looming darkness. There is a great black cloud in front of us. And I won't lie, we are heading right into the heart of it. And like I said before, we do not have much time. 
Come on, it's time for me to honor my promise and take you back to the future. <laughs>